Okay, let's get started. Welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us. My name is Josiah Neely. I am a senior fellow with the R Street Institute. I'm located here in beautiful Austin, Texas. Uh, and uh, this is our event looking at uh, electricity competition, how it fares in a crisis. Um, uh, you know, the February events and blackouts uh, were a tragedy uh, and they stressed show the electric system and the electric grid, not only in Texas, but in uh, large parts of the country. And since that time, uh, a lot of people have kind of pointed the finger at that event and at Texas, uh, claiming that it shows uh, limitations or flaws in our competitive market design, our system. At the same time, uh, Texas was not the only place that has faced challenges uh, for re reliability and other issues in, in the recent in recent years. And in fact, uh, in there have been some cases uh, uh, areas like in PJM that are actually considering moving away closer to uh, what we have here as opposed to what their baseline is there. So we thought it would be interesting to uh, have a distinguished group of panelists come and share their perspectives and research on how exactly did competition fare during the February events, uh, what uh, improvements could be made, what are the lessons learned for the system, and we, uh, so we're gonna, we're gonna talk to them. Uh, I, before I introduce the panelists, I, I want to say that uh, there will be a period for Q&A. So if you do have questions, uh, you can put them into the Q&A box. And then uh, when we're done with the initial uh, round robin, uh, we, we will have an opportunity for questions. So uh, uh, our first panelist, that we're going to discuss. Oh, I, one other thing I will mention is that one of our panelists, uh, Michelle Foss with the uh, Rice University's Baker Institute is currently having some technical difficulties. We hope that she will be able to join us uh, in progress uh, later on in the show. Uh, but for the time being, we're going to get started and we're going to go uh, to our first panelist, uh, who's going to be uh, Guy Sharfman, who is the Vice President of Market Analytics with Intelliment, Intelli Intelometry. Intelometry, yes. Okay. All right. Uh, so uh, thank you, Guy. Welcome. And uh, the floor is yours. Uh, sure. Um, so I've got a, uh, some slides that I've got and uh, that I'll go through. Um, uh, hopefully we have time to go through all of them. Uh, if not, um, I'd certainly encourage you to read the paper that we're gonna that I'm presenting here. Um, and so, just a quick note about Intelometry. Intelometry is is a systems data and consulting company that specializes in retail and renewable energy, uh, primarily in U.S. markets. And we work in U.S. markets uh, and in all U.S. markets, uh, including regulated markets. Uh, and we've been in business for for 18 years uh, and are still going strong. So. Um, I'm going to go ahead and, and bring up a slide presentation here. Uh, and let me just, uh, can the other, can, you, can everybody see that? Just making sure. Yes. I know okay, good. Um, okay. So the paper that um, myself and another colleague of mine, Jeff Marola, drafted uh, it's called Beyond, Tax, uh, Beyond Texas Evaluating uh, Customer Exposure to Energy Price, uh, Energy Price Bikes, a Case Study of Winter Storm, already February 2021. Um, and just a quick overview of the paper. Uh, we review the financial impacts of Winter Storm URI on both regulated uh, utilities as well as competitive suppliers. Uh, we compare how the financial losses due to the storm were dealt with uh, by each paradigm. Uh, and we ultimately conclude, which is just a counter narrative to I think everything that's been, been discussed since the storm, that it's actually regulated utilities who protected their shareholders at the expense of their customers in the aftermath of the storm, while competitive suppliers did the exact opposite. Competitive suppliers for the most part protected their customers 
um, at the expense of their shareholders because they took millions of dollars in, in damages that they won't recover. Um, so just a quick overview of the storm. I know that many people listening are probably familiar with it, but um, basically it occurred in February 2021, uh, primarily in the, in the center of the country. Um, it basically natural gas infrastructure uh, froze, resulting in acute fuel price spikes. Um, natural gas expenditures ran, ran uh, tens of billions of dollars above normal. A uh, few companies were hedged uh, and many, many sustained financial losses. And that includes both regulated utilities and competitive supply companies. Um, the price of natural gas in the, the worst trading hub went uh, 628 times normal. Uh, and in ERCOT, prices, uh, power prices um, remained at the $9,000 per megawatt hour cap uh, for days, which is about 415 times normal, uh, normal pricing for February. Um, and to put that in perspective, if these prices were passed on directly to a residential customer for a single day, their February commodity bill for gas would increase from $3.80 to over $2,000 per day. And their commodity bill for power would increase from about 74 cents to over $300 per day. Um, now, as uh, I think a lot of the uh, a lot of the viewers here are probably familiar with, the public narrative after the storm was that residential customers bore the costs associated with the high energy prices because of retail competition, uh, and that it, and this would never have happened under a regulated utility construct. Um, however, uh, when you take a deeper view, as we did. Uh, what you find is very few residential customers that were served by competitive suppliers uh, experience any kind of increased bills due to the storm. Um, and that competitive suppliers, for the most part, uh, in fact, in all cases where they had fixed price contracts, they basically honored those contracts and they, they took, you know, a multi-million dollar hit while protecting their customers, um, honoring their contract and, uh, contracts and protecting their customers under fixed price contracts. Uh, regulated utilities, on the other hand, um, as soon as the storm was over and they sustained these massive losses, they automatically, uh, they, they immediately started lobbying the regulators to allow them to recover um, all costs associated with the storm uh, from their captive rate base, um, which means that at the end of the day, they uh, protected their shareholders, make, making sure that they're kept whole um at the expense of their customers while competitive suppliers for the most part did the exact opposite um, so the winter storm ultimately impacted a 15 state area now you'll notice that only three of the states impacted by the storms uh, about by, by the storm even have retail competition uh, most almost all of them are regulated except for three uh, in texas you power is uh, for parts of texas not even all of texas uh, for parts of Texas, power is competitive. Uh, for Nebraska, gas is competitive. For Illinois, it's both. Every other state was uh, a regulated, uh, basically a regulated monopoly construct, yet it was the competitive market that got the most press. Um, during and after the storm, news coverage of rate pair impacts tended to focus on Texas, uh, really for two reasons. Uh, one is that Texas uh, sustained power outages uh, for most of the state, uh, which basically made headlines. The other was, and primarily it was due to a company called Gritty, which signed up residential customers and essentially sleeved the wholesale market price to those customers. Uh, so most of the time, those customers were actually saving money. But during URI, when prices were at the $9,000 cap for you know 72 to 96 hours, depending on ERCOT zone, um, they sustain these very, very high bills. And so, you, you know, it, it made a lot of uh, mainstream media headlines. Um, in truth, however, you know, most Texas residential customers were served on competitive fixed price contracts and they were insured, uh, basically insured them against price spikes. Um, further, even, even customers that were tied to wholesale supply, like the customers that were served by Gritty, um, will likely not have to pay the increased bills that they received because of ongoing litigation and government intervention. And actually uh, the Texas government actually outlawed residential customers to be on these uh, wholesale rates. Um, so the competitive suppliers on the other hand, um, while well, most of the customers were protected, the competitive suppliers were not and they lost uh, billions of dollars. Uh, and we've actually just from 
things that were essentially publicly available. We identified six suppliers that went bankrupt, seven that had to sell their business under duress, and five that stayed in business but had significant losses. In total, from just those suppliers, um, the loss amounted to $3.3 billion. And that isn't everyone. That is just data that we were able to get. We weren't able to get the financial losses of all competitive suppliers. In addition to that, what we also found was that even though the competitive suppliers lost a lot of money during URI, the price offers to residential customers did not increase after the storm, meaning that they basically just ate the, the loss for the most part. Now, there are, uh, there, there, there are some exceptions to that because uh, Texas did pass some bills that allow some of these competitive companies to recover some of the money they lost. Uh, primarily as it relates to ancillary services. But overall, uh, the if a customer was being served from a competitive supplier that was not gritty, um, they did very well during the storm, even though the, their, their, their supplying entity lost a lot of money. Um, regulated utilities, it was the exact opposite. We surveyed 67 regulated utility monopolies that sustained financial losses due to the storm uh, across the 15 states. In all cases, these monopolies uh, are seeking to recover all losses from their captive base of consumers uh, residing in their service territory. Uh, unlike the competitive retail market where fixed rate contracts prevent the subsequent collection of unexpected losses, utilities have applied for and are expected to receive cost recovery for all their losses, sometimes even including a profit margin, uh, thereby turning the, <clears throat> the a financial disaster essentially into a profit center um, just because they're, they're protected from, you know, from a regulatory perspective. The consequence is that with fewer no exceptions, utility monopolies will experience essentially no financial consequence due to winter storm. Ori, that's not true in 100% of cases, but it's true in a lot of them. Um, and in total, um, we, you know, if you, if you look across the, 50, the 15 states that we looked at, the losses to the utilities was about $14.5 billion. That is based on the best available data that we had at the time of doing this research. Uh, we got a lot of this data from regulatory documents. Sometimes we got it from, from other news sources. Um, all our sources are, are covered in the paper, uh, which also provides a lot more detail in the analysis that we did and the results. Um, and then the last slide I'm going to show you is this one, which is really, I think, the, the, the real story here, that if you take a look at the average cost incurred by a residential customer um, as a result of the storm, um, you'll find that the a residential customers belonging to competitive suppliers um, sustain the least amount of cost. So they're, they're on the hook, according to our analysis, of about $86 while the, re, uh, the, the residential customers associated with every other utility, like if you look at the average, it's in the hundreds. So really the narrative, and that's really the point of the paper was all wrong. If it's, it's really competition should be commended for what happened during URI, while it is the regulated paradigm that really puts the customers on the hook. Um, and I, that's all the slides I have. Um, I did have one. Yeah. Uh, I have one clarification question on this on this slide right here. So it's mm -hmm. good. Um, so you have uh, two numbers there: uh, eighty-six for the competitive suppliers, and then three seventy-three for the utility power monopolies. And then you've got down another row there for it's four hundred and fifty dollars for gas utility monopolies. So that that would be just for the just for the gas. So it's what are you. Customers are going to be on the hook for whatever their power is for the first two, and then plus the gas, or is it cumulative? Co correct. So if you are, if you have both commodities, uh, and we had to uh, just when we did this analysis, we originally tried to do it uh, just looking, you know, looking at power and gas combined, and it just really didn't work because you have overlap of customers and that just the way the data worked out. So we separated it into power and gas. So, but yes, if you are a customer who has to pay off your gas utility and your power utility, you're correct. The number would be uh, would be cumulative. Okay, all right. Well, as, as uh, someone uh, 
who is in a non-competitive zone for both gas and electric. I just want to know what I'm going to be on the hook for. So thank you very yeah, much. Yeah, and that's, uh, and to clarify, that's going to be, uh, so if you look at what the utilities are asking for, uh, it, it, it's, it's spread out during different time periods, right? So some utilities are trying to collect everything in a year. Some utilities are stretching it out for multiple years. Uh, I think the, the Texas securitization bills go out to 28 to 30 years. So it just depends. Yeah. But the point is, is that the, you know, the utility is basically just a cost recovery machine. Right. Every, every cost incurred goes, to, you know, there is no, there is no true hedge with the utility, right? You're, you're, you're on the hook for whatever the utility sustain and yeah. competitive suppliers. That's not true. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much, Guy. Uh, and then if you will. Yes. Share. I learned how to do this when we were preparing. Before, okay. How to stop sharing Absolutely. Those All right. There you go. Um, okay. So next, uh, we're going to move to Allison Silverstein, uh, who is a, uh, I mean, uh, uh, ubiquitous throughout the energy world, both in Texas and at the federal level. Uh, has a long, uh, uh, distinguished career. Consulting was involved with the DOE study back in 2017 May, did it I might have come out at the beginning of 2018 I don't know but um, uh, has also worked with uh, with other groups with the Mitchell Foundation of the play people uh, doing analysis and reports about the winter storm and the market redesign process that is currently ongoing at the Texas PUC so, uh, Allison, uh, I know you have some thoughts about what's going on. I know today, just today, we had uh, Chairman Lake of the Texas PUC came out with um, uh, sort of a, a proposal, some ideas of how he wants to change the current Texas system. Uh, other commissioners are going to be weighing in too. The public is going to be weighing in. So uh, why don't you give us uh, some of your thoughts about, about all of that? Thank you, and, and thank you for the invitation. I'm tickled to be here. Um, I have never been described as ubiquitous before. I'm not sure whether that's good or bad. If it's bad, I apologize to all of those for whom I have been ubiquitously inflicted on. Um, I, I want to open most, of, a lot of my job today is to respond to other people, so it's frustrating that, that Michelle isn't on so we could hear her comments as well. I'm amazed but not surprised by Guy's findings. Those are, that's an impressive piece of analysis that I look forward to, to reading. And I wanna point out that we set up the ERCOT market and moved Texas toward retail competition specifically for the purpose of transferring risk from customers to market participants who are better qualified to manage risk and bear the consequences of failing to manage risk including enjoy the benefits of managing risk effectively and profiting, which in Texas is considered to be a fair thing. Um, and, and I'm particularly struck by and resonate with his phrasing, regulated utilities, thanks to our legislators, were able to turn a grid disaster into a profit center, because that is clearly what's happening. And, and Guy, you should take that one a long way, because it's a great line and it's totally accurate. Um, the point of competition in a crisis is that some competitors succeed and some fail, fail. And that is, Guy talked about the economic consequences. But I want to remind all of us and everyone listening to us that in a crisis, it's not just competitors who succeed or fail. In most crises, it's customers and communities who get screwed because of competition. And not just because of competition, which was not set up, frankly, to help most customers and communities, but because we did not design the rest of the regulatory and, and legislative and sort of management system and infrastructure to protect customers in the event that competition fails. Competition is great at allocating money, but it is we need regulatory guardrails to address and protect the things that competition doesn't allocate fairly. And that means that it's appropriate to always establish rules and standards for little details like equity, for reliability, which clearly Texas and federal regulators failed to regulate adequately, 
because markets are good. Wholesale power markets are good when well designed at advancing reliability, but if done sloppily, there are many things that rely that markets do not support on reliability. Um, safety, gas infrastructure is one example of a particular guardrail that, that is critical to electric system market operation and reliability that nobody paid any attention to. Gas price gouging and price management are similarly things that um, none of us prepared, anticipated adequately. Let's be clear that managing risk is about anticipating threats and preparing to manage them. And many of the um, retail electric providers and wholesale producers who failed in Guy's list failed because they did not properly anticipate and hedge against the, the likelihood that gas would go not, gas, gas prices would go nuts and gas availability would, would diminish so markedly. So I want to put in a marker for yes, competition is great, but you need guardrails around the things that competition doesn't address effectively. I want to also address the point that all of the market design conversations that we have as you know, economists and regulatory fans and so on and so forth, 95% of the topics in those market design conversations and reform conversations address only the supply side. And we are all very, very good at crafting marvelous rules and nuances and models around how do we get the, the, the supply competition to be more aggressive and, and, and to allocate money on a finer point on competition, but on, on, at the supply level. But we are terrible at doing um, properly incorporating demand considerations beyond demand response, which people think of as something to, um, demand response is used to temper the enthusiasms of suppliers and reduce the hockey, hockey stick supply curve and pricing. But let's be clear that we need to significantly broaden the demand side, particularly in something as critical as cleaning up after a disaster like URI. We need infinitely more aggressive energy efficiency to protect customers and communities year round, as well as reducing their bills and protect, protecting them from the physical impacts of a disaster, like sitting in the dark for 50 to 70 hours straight in the cold, as well as from and, and the, all the, the hundreds of people who died after this event or during this event. Um, but we also needed to moderate the bills and to absorb and reduce some of the costs that our friends in the legislature have created by reallocating a lot of the costs that market participants should have borne by reallocating those through securitization and other measures onto the backs of customers. So that energy efficiency is a wonderful way to permanently reduce the magnitude of peak loads and to reduce the degree of heroism and, and um, drastic measures that we need to fix the market on the supply side. Um, what else do I wanna say about this? The, I'll shut up. Any sign of Michelle yet? Or do you wanna just go to questions? Yeah, so uh, unfortunately she's not able to join us, but uh you know i have read her study uh and so i'm going to try briefly to summarize the findings there so that that because i think that's also going to be an important part of the discussion uh so uh, this particular study uh it was it looked at outages during the february event in texas and it took advantage of uh the fact that while texas does have competition not all parts of Texas have competition. So there are certain areas in the state uh, that where you have, you still have a, a municipal owned utility or a co-op that was grandfathered in that is still vertically integrated. They still own their own generation resources. And so it looked uh, comparing the uh, generation resources that are owned by those non-competitive entities. How do they compare in terms of outages and other things to uh, competitively owned uh, resources. And so I'm going to try and share my screen. 
Okay. The interesting thing about her those findings in that paper was that that was like a total throwaway. Yes, yes. It, uh, it was, you know, two or three paragraphs and a little tiny chart in a in a 20 page paper. I know. And, and most uh, of us were like, this is huge. Tell me more. <laughs> yes. So uh, they did. So they uh, you can sort of see it. Let me see if I can move the panelists over here. Uh, kind of block out the, the beautiful R Street logo there. But I think people will be OK. So uh, you'll see four lines there. Um, what one thing that they did do is that they separated out competitive generators that uh, were only wind and that only had wind and solar in their mix because uh, there were no non-competitive or monopoly utilities that are only wind and solar owning, um, and uh, so so they they separated those out. And then there was also uh, one uh, particular monopoly utility as co-op. I won't say who it was, but they did much much worse than uh, everybody else, and so they wanted to exclude them. Uh, just to make sure that it wasn't that single outlier that was driving the difference. Uh, so, uh, but if you look at the two, uh, the two lines there, the orange line versus the blue line, you can see orange is bigger than blue. Orange is the monopoly utility. Blue is the competitive. So it's it's pretty straightforward. Uh, the competitively owned resources actually had a lower level of of outages pretty much throughout the entire crisis. Uh, there. A couple other things that uh, I would note. Um, uh, two, a couple, couple interesting things to that they note in the paper. One is that uh, uh, outages have actually decreased in Texas since the introduction of competition in the 1990s. The other is, you know, in other markets, um, they talked about because uh, one thing that I would like to discuss that has been discussed is whether. Texas should move to a capacity market uh, as opposed to the energy only market. Most, uh, in fact, all other regions in the country, uh, including those that have uh, retail competition or that have whole, uh, competition for electricity, they still have, they still maintain a capacity market uh, in addition to that. And uh, some, some people have suggested, well, if we had a capacity market, maybe that would have helped. Um, but actually the penalties uh, for uh, failing, you know, if you win a capacity market auction and then you fail to deliver, uh, the penalties for, for that are, are actually less than the $9,000 that people, uh, generators have to pay in February uh, due, to the, due to the wholesale market prices there. So that's, that's another thing that they noted. I'm going to see now if I can figure out how to unshare. I know uh, Guy was able to do it, so hopefully I'm able to do it. Okay. Fantastic. Um, okay, so uh, we're, we're gonna. For, so first, let me ask. Uh, we're gonna move into Q and A, but first, I want to see I, uh, Allison if you have any specific uh, comments or any reactions to my uh, brilliant summary of uh, of the Baker Institute's research. Uh, and then uh, we do have uh, one question for Guy that's in the queue already. If there are others, please uh, go ahead with that. But so, Alison, I don't know if you have any, if you wanted to respond or not. Your, your summary was, in fact, brilliant. And more broadly, not just about, although that is an important finding for, in the context of URI, that the competitive generators were better able, better prepared and weatherized and able to withstand the cold than the many of the monopoly regulated generators, we need to step back more broadly and look across history to observe that over the last 20 years, consistently generators that are competing in an active wholesale market that are unregulated have been consistently um, more efficient, have had significantly shorter outage times, have had significantly better heat rates, and have had significantly better availability factors and capacity factors than generators that are monopoly owned. And, and in fact, one of the things that we have seen is to cite the work of the wonderful Joe Daniels at Union of Concerned Scientists, many of the monopoly owned older generation have been self-scheduled 
long after, even though they are the least efficient resources, most costly in the market at any point in time, their owners are continuing to self-schedule those to keep um, getting their money's worth out of these in, in efficient resources, which has been resulting in consistently higher costs for their the, the owner's customers, the monopoly's customers, and consistently higher and, and forcing out more efficient resources that should be earning that place in the dispatch queue day to day. So the self-scheduling of monopoly owned inefficient resources has, has been a disaster for the last 10 years or more in, in all of the competitive wholesale markets. So it's not just about URI and yeah. it's not just about winter. All right, so we have a question uh, that I would like to build on that has to do with the uh, natural gas. Uh, and the uh, question is uh, directed to Guy, but as I build on it, I'm sure uh, Guy and Allison, you may both have comments. So uh, the question is, are there competitive gas suppliers in Texas? I assume large industrial customers buy their gas from competitive suppliers, but are there retailers operating in the residential small commercial markets? If so, how did they perform during URI? And uh, my, my build out on that question is, um, I, I, do, I do think uh, you know, the intersection of the natural gas market and the electricity market uh, differences between those in terms of performance and model uh, and response after the storm is, I think, uh, something that uh, there's a lot to say about. So I, I'd like to ask about that. But first, Guy, can you, I don't know if you have any thoughts, you know, about the nature of uh, the, the gas market, how it's set up in Texas. So and, and my understanding is that gas is not open in Texas. Uh, so the, you know, er, ERCOT, you have competition uh, for power, but not gas. Um, so we looked at gas primarily from a wholesale perspective when it comes to Texas uh, for the purpose of our paper. Yeah. And then Allison, you know, yeah. I, oh, I'm sorry if you had, I didn't know if you had more guy or. No, no, that's, that's, okay. that's, yeah. that's in a nutshell, basically. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah, Allison, I don't know if you have any thoughts about, um, you know, the, the gas market such, it is, such as it is, obviously, uh, FERC and NERC released their preliminary findings uh, in their inquiry about the February event uh, last week, I think it was. And one of their findings was that uh, while the primary uh, cause of outages and disruptions uh, to power during the event was uh, weather-related mechanical failures or other weather-related failures at the plant, there was a substantial proportion, I think it was 31% of the failures were due to disruptions in fuel supply. And uh, almost all of that was natural gas, people who were not able to get natural gas for, for whatever reason. Um, so what are your thoughts about that? What, what is the role of the gas system in, in, in all of this and, and how does that operate? The, the role of the gas system is huge. And let's, it is true, as our friends in the gas patch want to say ad nauseum, that there were many causes and part of the, for the gas failures. Let's be clear that a bunch of the, the, the gas system failures were like a rolling disaster with new causes jumping in and taking over from old causes. So what happened was that cold weather started around the Wednesday before the, um, the, the, the electricity was cut on the, the early morning at 1.30-ish. Actually, it started around midnight. They started cutting load um, at midnight on Sunday the 14th to Monday the 15th. So on the Wednesday before they started, gas, individual gas wells started freezing up. And then um, some of the wellhead system components started freezing up. By the time we had an ice storm across significant parts of West and Northern Texas, actually most of Texas was iced in on, on Friday and Saturday, which led to a great difficulty at getting people out to the oil fields to start fixing some of the, and, and to the pipelines to start fixing some of the, the frozen components and restore operation to a bunch of that gas and oil production because a significant amount of Texas 
of the gas production that goes into power plants is a co-product of oil production, not just about gas wells. And then um, we had, so, and then on about Friday, the gas pipeline started doing OFOs and announcing that they weren't going to be delivering to the, their contracted amounts to a number of the gas-fired power plants, as well as their contract, their contract suppliers starting to cut off and say, I'm not going to deliver the full amount that I contracted for. So you start seeing power plants on the gas side losing pieces of their gas supply or gas delivery commitments on the Friday and Saturday before the full power outage hit. And then you saw pieces of the power of the power generation power plants freezing up, which meant that they were less able to take gas at the same time that the railroad commission was changing the priority for gas deliveries to say, we're gonna take more of this gas and give it to residential customers. So it's just one thing after another hitting the amount of gas that could actually get to a power plant, as well as the capability of power plants to deliver gas, but up to, to use the gas. And then we get to the morning of um, the 15th when so many power, gas fired power plants, as well as other production, including wind, has been shut off or is unable to deliver to load because of transmission constraints. And all of a sudden we end up with the electric system having significant amount of load shed, which cuts off the ability of gas pipelines to continue operating because all of them switch to electric to support their critical operations. So at some point, the gas industry's failure to deliver, produce and deliver got switched over to the electric industry cutting them and compounding that. So by the time gas wells were able to produce again, we had a significant amount of the gas delivery capability shut off. So it was just one damn thing after another hitting the gas system. All of that is fixable, or at least a lot of that is fixable. And one of the things that we should be doing, and this goes back to my comments about guardrails. I apologize, this is like the longest answer ever. But one of the important guardrails for reliability and safety is it is ridiculous that things that are critical facilities for public safety and public service like gas pipeline, compressor stations, and critical storage and processing in the gas system are depending on electricity rather than having from the grid, rather than having standalone backup generation photovoltaics and battery capability so that they can by God ride through a two or three day outage that would be caused by any standard Texas self-respecting hurricane or tornado. So they should be, if they want to be treated as a public service and a critical facility, then they should by God stand up and act like it and protect themselves instead of expecting us to protect all of them. That doesn't count the issue of the prices going up starting on the Tuesday and Wednesday, forward prices across the Midwest were jumping and um, what they hit $9,000 and way higher because of the supply constraints, but they were going up well before supply got cut off so, so significantly. And that affected the entire, the failures of Texas gas delivery and of Texas gas prices going sky high affected the entire Midwest, not just Texans. So it's just a whole, we don't have any price gouging rules. We got nothing to better manage this. And it's just stupid and irresponsible. All right, so uh, first, uh, we are now joined by uh, Michelle Foss. Michelle, welcome, uh, and I apologize for the, the technical difficulties, the logistical difficulties there. Welcome. Uh, it, we, so uh, you, you missed the presentations uh, uh, from Guy and Allison, but um, I, I, I briefly reviewed uh, the, the, I tried to hit the high points of your paper. If you wanted to go uh, into your presentation, we could do that uh, or yeah, or we could do a, a Q and A, whichever you want to do. You want to, you want to go well, into your- the, the real technical problem was apparently a time zone difference. 
Um, <laughs> I had 130 on my calendar and 130 in every conversation and didn't realize that that, that was that uh, happens. Yeah, it's uh, very tricky. Uh, <laughs> even though I think we are Eastern all, time, I guess. Yeah, I think so I apologize know, to Allison and apologize to to Guy for missing your discussion. Yes. And um, so let's just I mean, so Josiah, um, you know, uh, people can go to the to the link on the Baker Institute website for what I cooked up with Pat and Brett, and you know the most important thing is our view that um, you know in an, in a nutshell um, a competitively designed market that's not the issue. The problem is all the other stuff, the other baggage and other constraints and other things. And the only other point that I was going to make for everyone is um, I, I was going to put on a different hat, put on my um, uh, producer household hat, um, because we do have production in Texas. Mm -hmm. um, our production, like other um, operators and non-operators, um, we're oil, so we use electric submersible pumps. Our ESPs are all grid connected. This is something that has evolved a lot since the 2011 event um, that everybody knows about. And everybody knows, and I don't know if it's come up already, um, that the for NERC review of the 2011 event, um, identified gas industry, electric power industry, uh, harmonization as a specific issue, and particularly em emerging grid connectedness of natural gas operations. And wow, that is true. Um, and there's every incentive in the world for producers to stay connected to the grid. Our pumps have to run full time. Um, we were out for the entire time period a total of about 10 days on our wells. So we couldn't have delivered gas even if, <laughs> even if we had wanted to. It's horrible to see you know, all of the prices not be able to respond. We had, we had grid connected processing capacity out. We had grid connected pipeline compressor uh, capacity out. Um, and so you know, this is something that we have to figure out as a, as a state and a market and a industry and so on. So those were the only other things that I was going to add. Um, to the mix. And what you can do is send around, we'll send around links to papers and things like that if you'd like um, after your discussion. Yes, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you for that. So we do have, a, so we've got a couple questions in the chat. Uh, I, uh, I also have uh, something that I would like to, to get the panelists perspective on about uh, what folks in other parts of the country uh, what 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 their takeaways should be from all of this. But uh, before we get to that, um, we do have a question about uh, market concentration. Uh, it suggests that, you know, uh, if you have greater concentration in the market into fewer large electric retailers who have survived, there's kind of a winnowing. Uh, does that, you know, pose some concerns going forward in terms of fewer, you know, Fewer competitors maybe me translates into higher prices uh, going forward. So I didn't know if anyone had any thoughts about that uh, with the with the failures that you had in some of these companies. Yeah. Yeah, I can I can chime in on that. So uh, the what what we found was actually the, the surprisingly was the the opposite. Um, so basically, what happened after the storm, you had suppliers that. You know, went bankrupt, and you the 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 number of offers that you had out to customers actually went down as a result. But the offers themselves went down as well, um, which was strange uh, because you had well, I don't know if it's strange, but it was it may be counterintuitive because um, you had less suppliers out there. Um, and they just, the suppliers that you still had left were, you know, sustained all these losses, but competition apparently still fierce enough that they couldn't, you know, that it, we certainly saw no sign of, of, you know, any, any kind of price coordination or anything like that. If anything, um, the market appeared as competitive as ever. Um, and it, like I said, it actually, the, the, the offers after the storm, and we looked at, months leading up to the storm and then after the storm. And, you know, we accounted for, you know, um, differences in, in, you know, just, just differences in the, in, in, in the uh, season, seasonal differences. And yeah, the, the offers went down for a 12 month fixed price contract um, was actually lower after, after URI. And we, we tracked that for a couple months. 
Um, and I think the uh, even even in more recent months, um, outside of of natural gas kind of going up, uh, which had nothing to do with which we don't believe has anything to do with the storm. Um, yeah, the offers basically stayed low. Uh, so the, the 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 key here is that uh, what we saw was that not only did competitive suppliers truly protect their customers, but the market uh, kept their prices low even after or kept their prices at, at normal levels, even after the storm, regardless of, of the financial losses. Um, One of the great things about the Texas, Texas has the ro most robust retail market of anywhere in the nation, possibly in the world. And one of the great things about that is the creativity and breadth of services and innovation that that offers to customers who avail themselves of retail competition and choice. One of the impressive things to me about the conversation that is going on in parallel to this, right this minute at the Public Utility Commission, is this morning as the commissioners were discussing how do we do market redesign on the wholesale side to advance reliability, every one of them said repeatedly, we have to be careful about what this, the wholesale market redesign and reforms do mean for market power and particularly for the health and level of competition in the retail market. And they all said uniformly, if we do wholesale market reforms that hurt retail competition, we are making a mistake and I will not vote for that, which was impressive and astonishing. And um, one of the reforms one of the consequences of the current reform effort that I hope to see is even more enablement of demand response and a lot of really creative retail offerings and demand aggregation options that we haven't previously seen that let customers help themselves as well as exert more influence in the wholesale market. So uh, we do have a, a question for you, Allison, uh, regarding you had mentioned uh, in monopoly areas, sometimes uncompetitive units get self-dispatched by the monopoly. And uh, it was a question about the type of units, where, whether these were fossil units, and if so, were they displacing other fossil units? Were they displacing renewable energy? Do we know anything about, uh, about that? Yes, we do, actually. These are pretty uniformly coal units that were built particularly by co-ops and smaller um, vertically integrated monopoly public utilities. And um, it's been going on for a number of years. Joe Daniel at Uni Union of Concerned Scientists did a number of excellent analyses documenting all of this and showing their market impacts. Because these are being self-dispatched, it is hard to see that they are being, you know, the idea is they are being sold to, to your own customers is the rationale. And so in theory, you are not, if your, your rationale is the regulated or monopoly utility is I'm not displacing anyone else. But in point of fact, you could be buying cheaper gas or renewables from other competitors in the market rather than running your old coal plant just because you've got it in rate pace and you've got a long-term coal contract. So the answer is yes, it is displacing other resources and it is displacing all kinds of other resources, but it's hard to, you can do modeling, but it's hard to do a one-for-one -one assignment of operation of this coal plant today is displaced, has kept that wind plant from being dispatched or that gas plant from being marginal. Typically, it's the other way around. So the, the, the terminology correction is wind and solar are non-dispatchable. When they're available, they come on the grid. Right. So to Allison's point, I mean, you know, it's actually opposite effect. You're knocking off other generation sources when that happens, which has other implications and ramifications uh, in the market and, and for market development. Yeah, thanks for that clarification. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, okay, so uh, two notes. First, uh, for though the Baker Institute paper is uh, linked in the in the chat right now, uh, it's also going to be uh, this event is being recorded, uh, and it's going to be up on our website along with links to the papers. Um, in last question or topic I'd like to ask is 
you know, I'm a Texan, so obviously my first thought is always about Texas and what Texas should do and go forward. But I know that uh, a lot of other states uh, have been thinking about making changes to their electrical regulatory system in the direction of competition. You have states like uh, Arizona that may be looking at retail competition. You have states uh, like uh, South Carolina that may be thinking about joining an RTO. There are other parts of the country that are looking about looking at reevaluating their capacity construct, maybe moving in a more competitive direction. To what you know, just based on everything that we've discussed here today, what do you think uh, the lessons and takeaways? What should other states view the takeaways? uh of the february events in terms of the the value and benefit of competition what what would you say to that and uh we'll let, let's do uh uh guy allison and then michelle uh, sure so um you know per, per our research we actually show that the competition uh is actually protected consumers better than the regulated utilities did um, also, and I think uh, the other panelists have, have alluded on this actually have explained it rather well. I think the, the biggest problem with with URI was really an in infrastructure and a, you know, the, the way that power, the, the power industry deals with the gas industry. Uh, and those are structural uh, problems that need to be uh, that need to be dealt with. But I don't, you know, when you, when you look at retail electricity or retail natural gas, those are not problems that um, you know are solvable by simply re redoing the market or making it regulated. The regulated utilities lost money, competitive suppliers lost money, and the you know the 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 storm I think uh, well, the storm basically um, shed light on a number of deficiencies uh, that the system had. But I don't think it had anything to do with. Um, you know the competitive retail market and i think the biggest problem the biggest hurdle that you know people like me who who believe in competition and want to see it all over the country is that the narrative that was created post storm hmm. um automatically focused on you know the the focused on competition even though that wasn't uh really the the cause of it there wasn't these these discussions as we're having now about all the structural problems and how to fix them it automatically created a boogeyman called competition that um, you had uh, executives and other utilities that would published op-eds saying this is why you never want competition in our state so if you look at the narrative it was counterproductive to competition you know after the storm but but really that needs to be corrected i believe that um when you really look at competition, I've looked at retail competition in a number of states. We've done, you know, countless, call it studies, call it reviews, um, and it's always it always yields a benefit. If you look at uh, prices, that ultimately always come down. The default prices that the utilities have always come down. Uh, you know, when you hear utilities say, "Well, our default prices are better than competitive prices," well, those default prices are a function of competition in the state. Um, and so they would never have been lower if competition wasn't introduced. And I think, um, you know, when you look at a, at, at, at a, at, you know, a, at an event like URI, I think the, 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 the biggest thing we can do is really shape the narrative to be accurate, not to be this uh, knee-jerk reaction of blaming competition, which, which seems, to, seems to happen in, in every, really every event um as far as the the power or gas industry is concerned at least in the u.s all right allison i i agree with a lot of what guy just said and let's be more explicit disasters like yuri are like a rorschach test you can read anything into it that you want to you can find any conclusion renewables are bad renewables are good competition is bad competition is good regulators failed you fill in, you know, whatever your bias is, you can find something to justify it in the URI disaster or in the polar vortexes or in the California outages of last year. There's always a scapegoat to be found, whatever your choice of scapegoat is, you can justify it. 
I think I agree with all of your comments, Guy, about how competition tends to consistently drive prices down for customers, for energy production, et cetera. And it tends to, even beyond that, encourage innovation and facilitate new entry of new technologies in great ways. But let's be clear that competition can't do it all. And we need to set up a good context of intelligent regulation and physical and institutional infrastructure that covers all of the ground that competition can't so that we use competition for what it's good at and protect people and cover the bases that competition can't serve. Your turn, Michelle. So to pile on, what I would say to Allison's points is all of that's fine so long as you can design your regulatory oversight, you can provide the context in a way that actually doesn't come back to haunt in terms of hurting competition and competitive forces. And I think that's what we tend to do over and over again in every industry, every market. Um, we always overshoot. Um, this is always the inclination. Um, I, I think if we had all of the data that we could possibly want as researchers, what we would see is that it's not just price benefits, although ultimately um, competitive forces produce that as a, as a measurable result, but it's how people manage portfolios, it's how they build management teams, it's the choices they make, it's how they think about risk. All of those things are so much more productively done in a, in a, in a competitive environment. I, I mean, there's no question. We have 500 years of economic thought <laughs> and engineering experience to, to demonstrate all of that. But somehow, you know, every, those, those, um, those uh, uh, reactions after events, whatever they are, um, you know, always nudge us to think that somehow, um, you know, we can override that and, and it's better. But, but I don't think so. I mean, I think ultimately that's what we found in our own um, little review, very, very small review of the event. There's a lot of other work going on over here at the Baker Institute related to electric power right now. So we're gonna be wrestling with this. Um, I think going forward, you know, the ultimate question is for the things that people want to try and want to experiment with, whether it's demand response, whether it's using more wind and solar, whether it's doing something else, how to keep existing legacy generation in the mix, any of these things. Um, it's it's a, always a challenge to figure out how do you how do you create the boundaries without distorting the signal so much that you exacerbate the the events that you know will certainly happen. I think this winter is going to be another test. I don't know if it's going to be as bad. There's already a lot of worry about it in the trading community and the um, in the in the gas and power businesses. Um, there are lots of indicators that it'll be another challenge. Um, I don't know, Allison, whether in earlier, you know, you mentioned anything from the PUC proceeding so far that might give us some confidence that we can, um, you know, uh, hopefully get out of whatever winter events we have better than we have before. But, you know, that is very real. And, and so, uh, you know, we have to be thinking about those things. Agreed. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, Allison. No, bring us home, Josiah. Okay, great. Uh, so uh, I want to thank our panelists for joining us for having a great discussion. I want to thank our all of you, our viewers, uh, for coming, watching, participating with questions. Uh, as I mentioned, this is being recorded, so it will be up on our website. If you want to uh, share the link with other people, find links and information about the papers discussed. Um, I have been your host, Josiah Neely, Senior Fellow at the R Street Institute. It's over now. Goodbye.